last time was really just an introduction, and this time we want to actually go into the meat of the Apocrypha, go into the Apocryphal texts, the texts, the Sifrei Chitzonim, that weren't included in the Tanakh, and see what, they, what do they say, you know, and what made them so controversial. But before we can actually go into that, we have to ask the important question, are we even allowed to do this? Are we allowed to study Sifrei Chitzonim? Because they were excluded for a reason. So are we even permitted to delve into them? That's the question. And this is explored in the Gemara, in the, in the Talmud Mishnah, in Masechet Sanhedrin. Okay, Sanhedrin chapter 10 begins, it's a very famous chapter, a lot of you have heard it, uh, or parts of it, studied parts of it in the past, and it's Perek Chelek, which is about, which starts by talking about who has a portion, Chelek means a portion, who has a portion in the world to come. So who has space in the afterlife. Okay? So that's how the Mishnah begins like this, in Sanhedrin chapter 10. It says, a verse you've all heard before, Kol Israel yesh laim chelek le'olam haba. Every person in the people, among the people of Israel, has a portion in the world to come. Okay, so you are made, your soul was made with its corresponding place in the afterlife. Of course, when God made your soul, he didn't make your soul to make it suffer for eternity. He made the soul with its own afterlife portion already guaranteed with an address in the afterlife for that soul. And how do we know? Because Isaiah chapter 60, Ishayahu, says, there's a verse that says, and your nation, kulam tzadikim. Your nation are all righteous. Doesn't always show, but in principle, every soul is righteous. We just have to actually realize that potential. Amech kulam tzadikim. Really, it's talking about the world, to come. like in the future world, when the, everybody will be righteous, but v'amech kulam tzadikim, and it says, le'olam yirshu aretz, that they will forever inherit the, the world. Okay. Which world? Not the physical world, but because it's forever. We're talking about the spiritual world, the afterlife. They will have an f- eternal portion in the world to come. So that's how it begins. That's the first part of the Mishnah. Everybody's got a portion in the afterlife. Everybody is really righteous or should be righteous. Everybody's supposed to be righteous. And so everybody has a portion in the afterlife. But then it continues. But then these are the people who forfeit their portion in the world to come. So everybody comes down into this world with a portion in the afterlife, but they may forfeit that portion. portion? Your unique portion. That's right. Your specific place there. So who are these people who are the exceptions? First. A person who says there's no resurrection of the dead. From the Torah specifically. But we know back then, we discussed this before, Sadducees, Pharisees, the Tzdukim, for instance, did not accept that there's an afterlife of any kind. Since the Chumash doesn't really seem to mention it, they didn't believe it. They went strictly according to the Chumash. And since the Chumash doesn't really talk about some spiritual afterlife, it really only talks about the world here, So the Tzedukim, the Sadducees, they didn't accept that there's any afterlife or any resurrection of the dead in the future. So somebody who doesn't believe in a resurrection of the dead or doesn't believe in an afterlife, then they don't get an afterlife. It's pretty simple. You didn't believe in it, so you're not going to get it, right? It's pretty straightforward. So somebody who says that there's no resurrection of the dead, really, it says... That somebody who denies that it's a Torah principle, even somebody who says that it's a rabbinic thing, that it's a rabbinic invention, or that is also a problem. Even if you say that it's from Nach and not from the Chumash, because the Nevi'im do speak about a resurrection of the dead. Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Yechezkel, right? The, the vision of the dry bones, Ishayahu. They, they do speak about, reference the resurrection of the dead. Where do we see it in the Chumash itself? Where is there a clear reference to Tchiyat Metim in the Torah of Moses? In Parashat Ha'azinu, it says, Mo- Moses sings the song, Moshe, and he says, he quotes God as saying, Ani amit I put to death and I bring to life. So based on that, that God is saying, I put to death and I bring to life, that's a source for the resurrection of the dead, straight from the Chumash itself, from the Torah of Moses. Because God is saying, I, he says first, I will put to death, and, then, and I will bring to life. So it implies, his machatzti of Anirpa, I wound you and I heal you, I put you to death and I bring you to life. So that implied the order of those words, right? He didn't say I bring to life and I put to death. Because that you could just say is, okay, a baby's born and it dies. But the order is reversed. The order is I put to death 
and I bring to life, meaning the death comes first, and then you're still alive again, that God gives you more life after death. All right? So that's actually a really clear place from the Torah itself, that there is tchiyat metim, that there's some afterlife of some sort. Exactly what tchiyat metim is, the resurrection of the dead, perhaps we'll leave for another day. What does that really mean, resurrection of the dead? But there's definitely an afterlife. So somebody who denies that there's an afterlife doesn't get their afterlife. Pretty simple. What, what else? The second person is ve'ein Torah min ha-shamayim. So somebody who says ein Torah min ha-shamayim, that the Torah is not divine. If a person denies the divinity of the Torah, again, you've basically, you're a heretic. You've, you've went against a fa- fundamental principle of Judaism. If the Torah is not divine, then like really, what's the point, right? The, the whole religion, is the, every, the whole system is based on the fact that the Torah is from heaven. So the Torah is divine. So somebody who denies that the Torah is from heaven, that's a heresy that you, with that, a person will forfeit their share in the world to come. That's the second one. And the third one is a general term, ve'apikoros. An apikoros. What does that mean, apikoros? That's a, that needs its own long discussion. What constitutes, what makes somebody an apikoros? It's translated as a heretic of some sort. What kind of heresy makes you an apikoros? So the word apikoros, anybody know where it came from? That's right. There's a Greek philosopher, Epicurus, right? One of the Greek schools of thought uh, in ancient times, around the time of Aristotle, a bit after, right, was uh, Epicurus. And he is associated with hedonism, the school of hedonism, which today people think means like hedonism means the only purpose of life is to maximize pleasure. Just have fun. Okay? Don't worry about anything. Just have lots of fun. Don't fear God. Don't fear death. Don't fear... Just maximize your pleasure. So today, yeah. Public Public school. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. Exactly. So today, hedonism has a very negative connotation as just like being very licentious and do whatever you want and whatever. But Epicurus himself didn't... That's not what he taught. Epicurus still said that you have to be a righteous person. You have to live a life of virtue. You have to be a good person. You shouldn't abuse things and... Yes, the ultimate good is to be happy. Of course, that's what everybody wants. We have to achieve, in Greek, it's called eudaimonia, right? We want to achieve happiness, ultimately, and peace from all kinds of troubles and worries, right? So we want to attain happiness, but that doesn't mean that you should commit all kinds of, vice, like, you know, all kinds of sins and live a life of vice. You should still live, lead a life of virtue. He had four rules, Epicurus. They're called the tetrapharmakos, the four cures for your life. And the first of them was, don't fear God or the gods. Back then, they, the Greeks had many gods, right? Don't fear the gods. Don't worry about the punishment from above. Don't worry about death. So people always are afraid of death, and then they don't live properly because death holds them. The fear of death holds them back, and they don't actually live. Don't fear death. And what is good is easy to get, and what is terrible is easy to endure. Those were his four main principles. Okay. So you can see why this would be a heresy. Because his first principle is don't fear God. So right away, if you're saying don't fear God, that's kind of the opposite of what the Torah is always talking about, of having Yerat Hashem, of being God-fearing. So, of course, he was talking to ancient Greek polytheists who had nonsensical beliefs. So yeah, all that nonsense polytheism, we shouldn't fear those fake idol gods, yes. But uh, for our purposes, where we have one God, the, the one true God, then yes, you're supposed to fear God. Love should come first, but... Fear is also there. There's ira and there's ava. So there's the love of God. There's the fear of God. So you can see why being associated with Epicurus would make you a heretic. Because the number one principle of Epicureanism is don't fear God. Okay, just live your life. Live a virtuous life. Be a good person. But don't fear God. Okay, so that would be totally heretical for a Jew. So for a Jew to be an Epicurus is a serious heresy. Because it means it's kind of like being an atheist essentially. The Apicoris was the atheist of 2,000 years ago. So that's why an Apicoris forfeits their share in the world to come. Okay, great. So far, so good. This is the part that's relevant for us. Rabbi Akiva adds, Rabbi Akiva Omer, Afa kore basfarim achitzonim. And somebody who studies the apocryphal books, the books that were excluded from the Tanakh, the Sifrei Chitzonim, forfeits their share in the world to come. Pretty serious. Now, that's Rabbi Akiva's opinion. Okay, so first of all, it's important to remember when you study a Mishnah, the way it works is typically 
when you have an opinion, like the first, the first statement ha- is not an opinion. The first statement is a statement. Like, Kol Yisrael, that's just a clear teaching. That's a consensus. That's a fact. This is what it is. Now, the Mishnah will add individual opinions. So typically, those individual opinions are just the opinions of that person, and that's not necessarily, that's not the halacha, right? The halacha follows the majority, the consensus. So the initial statement, the unnamed statement, that's a fact, that's an halachic reality. And then Rabbi Akiva's opinion is also one who does this. So generally speaking, those individual opinions, we don't follow them. Sometimes we do, because sometimes it'll say, as we'll see later, unless otherwise stated, we don't, generally speaking, we don't follow individual opinions, we follow majority opinions. So Rabbi Akiva's opinion is somebody who reads these Farim Chitzonim, we, we have to really define exactly what he meant, that person will also forfeit their share in the world to come. And he gives one more, which might shock you, because today it's something like, something that I think a lot of people might do today, or something similar. And Ve'alochesh alamaka, somebody who whispers over their wound, somebody has an injury, and they whisper over their injury, they recite verses like Ve'omer, a verse in the Torah, in Shmot, Kol ha-machala asher samti b'mitzrayim lo asim alecha ki ani Hashem rofecha. That there's a verse in the Torah that God is saying that all the plagues that I put upon Egypt, I won't put upon you because I am your healer. Ani Hashem rofecha. God is our healer. So a person who has an injury and recites some biblical verse over it to heal himself, that person is also, according to Rabbi Akiva, a heretic that loses their share in the world to come. What's the context? The one yes. No, like on a person's injury. Like a person broke their foot or has a scab or whatever, anything. Like any wound that you have on your body and you start reverse, uh, reciting verses from the Torah in an attempt to somehow mystically heal your wound wow. through the power of those verses, according to Rabbi Akiva, that's crazy. Like, you don't do that kind of thing. What? So it might seem like today, you know, somebody's sick, we recite Tehilim for them. Yeah. Kind of seems similar, no? So this one is a little more specific. This one is somebody who's like, mamash whispering over a wound. And a specific verse that has to do with healing with the intention that this will help the healing. So according to Rabbi Akiva, again, this is his individual opinion, that's no good, all right? So <laughs> can't do that. So it's different than what we do today, which is reciting Tehilim in the merit of a person, because Tehilim has real spiritual power, and like we're increasing the merit for that person, and then hopefully they will, they will be healed. So it's not quite the same. Right? But Rabbi Akiva didn't like if people were reciting verses over a wound. Okay. And... Abba Shaul adds the last opinion. Abba Shaul says, Af et Hashem And somebody who actually recites the ineffable name of God. You know, we, don't, we never say God's name. We say Hashem or other things, but we never actually pronounce God's name. So if you pronounce God's name the way it's supposed to be with its letters, you lost your share in the world to come. And that, that needs discussion as well. Why is this name forbidden to be pronounced? Why is it the ineffable name? But we'll leave that aside for now. So, going to Rabbi Akiva, his opinion is Sifrei Chitzonim are not allowed. Okay, what does that mean? Is he really talking about these apocryphal books? So, the Bartanura, who's a commentary on the Mishnah, but much later, the Bartanura lived about 500 years ago. So, the Bartanura's comment on this Mishnah is like this. Besfarim Chitzonim, what is this referring to? It's referring to Sifrei Minim, the books of various her- sectarians and heretics, like... Kegon, Sifrei Aristo, like the books of Aristotle. So the Bartonura holds that this is talking about like general, like Greek philosophy books. Okay? Not necessarily apocryphal books, but Greek philosophical books, like reading the works of Aristotle. Okay? Aristo Ayavani the the Greek philosopher Aristotle and all his buddies, the Greek philosophers. So you shouldn't study Greek texts. That's what the Bartonura is saying. And he adds, again, he's explaining Rabbi Akiva's opinion. Saying, and, and a person who reads like history books about various foreign Gentile kings, the, the, the chronicles of their various kings. That's also no good. And somebody who also reads anything that's basically fiction, that's just stories, secular music, none of that is good because they're pointless, 
they're just ela ibudzman. They're just a waste of time. Okay, so don't waste your time. Study God's wisdom. That's the Bartanur explaining what Sfarim Chitzonim means. So he's saying Sfarim Chitzonim is like anything that's not Torah. But that's a very late, that's a, somebody who lived 500 years ago. That's his commentary on the Mishnah. Just to point out, he didn't necessarily hold that it's Apocrypha. He said that Sifrei Chitzonim is like anything not Torah. Okay. But again, he's only talking about Rabbi Akiva's opinion. That doesn't mean that that's Allah. So somebody who does read a history book, that doesn't mean you forfeited your share in the world to come. All right? It's important to emphasize that. He's just talking about Rabbi Akiva's opinion. Now, if we go to the actual Talmud itself, how does the Talmud explain this Mishnah? The Talmud Yerushalmi, remember we have two Talmuds, right? The Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, and the Bavli, the Babylonian. The, the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud says like this. Okay, what does it mean, Sfarim Chitzonim? Kegon Sifrei Ben Sira, like the book of Ben Sira. That, we do know what that is. And the Sifrei Ben Lana. Okay, we don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. If anybody knows who's Ben Lana, not Bin Laden, Ben Lana. We don't know who that is. So that, those kinds of books, the Talmud Yerushalmi says, are forbidden. So Ben Sira we do know and we have. So we're going to have to explore that one. Aval, the Jerusalem Talmud continues, Aval, Sifrei Homeris, the books of Homer. Homer, you know, the Greek famous, the Trojan War, the Iliad, remember this? The Odyssey. Yeah, so Homer, the books of Homer, and all books since that time, going forward, since biblical times until today, it's no big deal to read it. It's like reading a letter. It's just literature. It's just whatever. It's entertainment. So not like the Bartanura, the Talmud Yerushalmi is just saying, really what's, what's not allowed is books like Ben Sira, which we're going to have to explore what that is. But all other books, even the books of Homer, even like Greek, like Greek fables wouldn't necessarily be problematic. That doesn't mean we should read them. It's just you wouldn't forfeit your share in the world to come. And that's what it's saying. Now, the Bavli has the same, says the same thing. The Bavli says, Sifrei Minim, what does that mean? Tana, Rav Yosef said, Besefer Ben Sira. And so more specifically, the Bavli says, Ben Sira, books like Ben Sira are not allowed. And the Talmud actually goes into this and says, well, what's wrong with Ben Sira? Okay. Ben Sira is the name of a person who lived around 22, 2300 years ago. We're not quite sure. And he basically wrote this book. It reads like Proverbs, like Mishle, like King Solomon's Proverbs. It's just like Musav. It's just ethical advice, moral advice, how to be a good person, do this, don't do that. All kinds of very interesting things. I'll give you some examples. You want some examples? Let me see. I think I cropped some examples. So it'll say things like, uh, where did I put it? Like this. Do not envy the glory of the sinner, for you do not know what disaster awaits him. The minds of fools are in their mouths, but the mouths of wise men are in their minds. Beautiful. Right? Very nice. Very nice. Things like that, right? There's a long thing about uh, marriage, about friends. Uh, let those who are friendly to you be many, but one in a thousand, your confidant. When you gain friends, gain them through testing and do not be quick to trust them. For there are friends when it suits them, but they will not be around in time of trouble. Right? Another is a friend who turns into an enemy. Others are friends, table companions, but they cannot be found in times of affliction. When things go well, they are your other self and lord it over your servants. And so on. Like things like that. Like general life advice. You know. So what's wrong with it? And the Talmud actually goes into this. The Talmud says, what's wrong with Ben Sira? It has a lot of great things. It supports a lot of what's written in the Torah. And we don't really have a clear answer. It doesn't really say what, what exactly is the problem with Ben Sira. And even more problematic, what's shocking is the Talmud itself, in other places, quotes from Ben Sira quite extensively. So it must be itself. It must be exactly. Exactly. So the Talmud in multiple places directly quotes from Ben Sira. In one place, in Baba Batra, it uses it as an asmachta, as like a proof, like as if it's a verse of Tanakh. It uses it as if it's Tanakh. Um, there's a pasuk that says, I want to read it right. To it tell also mentions apocryphal texts as well. So. so this is the only one that the Talmud actually directly quotes. <clears throat> so one place where it quotes it in Baba Kama, uh, page 92b, it, it asks a question of, there's this principle that the sages teach 
that bad people always have a way of finding each other. Crooks have a way of finding each other. You know? How do we know this? And it says, we know this from the Torah and from Nevi'im and from Ketuvim. So the Talmud brings a proof and a smachta for this principle from all parts of Tanakh, presumably. So it says, how do we know it from the Torah? Because in the Torah, it says, Katuv Torah, in, in Bereshit, in Genesis, it says, Vayilech Esav el Ishmael. That Esav went to Ishmael. We know Esav married Ishmael's daughter. So there's a wicked Esav, there's a wicked Ishmael, and they came together. They found each other. So two wicked people find each other. That's a proof from the Torah. Now we have Banavim. In the prophets, same thing. In the prophets, we have a pasuk. How do we know? In Shoftim, it says, Ve'itlaktu el Iftach anashim rekim. That there, one of the judges of Israel was named Iftach. Iftach agiladi. Same thing. There's a pasuk that says, Wicked people found him. So bad people have a way of finding each other. And umeshulash baktuvim. And we also find it in Ktuvim. Where? Dichtiv. In Ben Sira. Because the pasuk in Ben Sira says, Kol of lemino ishkon. Okay, so in Ben Sira, it says that birds, birds of a feather flock together, right? That's that old, pro, that old uh, saying, adage, comes from Ben Sira, that birds have a way of finding each other too, that the same kinds of birds flock together, right? So it's using Ben Sira as a proof, and it's even saying it's in Ketuvim. That's pretty crazy, right? The Talmud itself is using Ben Sira, a, verse, a, a very well-known adage from Ben Sira, as proof. So clearly, and this is not the only place, there are multiple places where the Talmud will even say Kidichtiv, like as it's written in Ben Sira. And it's almost like they think it's part of Ketuvim here. It's saying that it's in Ketuvim, which is really revolutionary. So the, the place, even though there's this opinion that Ben Sira is apocrypha and shouldn't be read, or books like Ben Sira shouldn't be read, the Talmud itself is reading them and quoting them. So just to emphasize the point that it is okay, ultimately, to read these books. You don't forfeit your share in the world to come, that even when certain books that seem troublesome, they're not necessarily problematic. So the Talmud can't really find a good reason to ban Ben Sira, doesn't really understand why some held that it was, should be forbidden, and itself the Talmud quotes from it. All right? So that's important to remember. Now, my own theory, by the way, in in the book of Ben Sira, the Greek version of it, the Greek translation, it actually has a little introduction, and it says that the grandson of Ben Sira translated the book into Greek. And over there, he says that like, it was never meant to be in Tanakh. This book was never meant to be a Tanakh book. He wrote in the introduction, the grandson, he said, my grandfather, whose name was Yoshua Ben Sira, that he wrote after devoting himself for a long time to the reading of the Torah and the prophets and the other books of our forefathers, so meaning Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. So my, my grandfather spent a lot of years studying Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, studying the Tanakh, and after attaining considerable proficiency in them, was led to write on his own account something in the line of instruction and wisdom, so that lovers of learning and persons who become interested in these things might make still greater progress in living accordance with the law, with the Torah. So the introduction to the book, at least the Greek version, he goes on to say that I translated into Greek because a lot of Jews back then lived in Alexandria. Many Jews spoke Greek, as we'll talk about. So he said, let's translate it into Greek so it's more accessible. But clearly it was never meant to be part of Tanakh. It was not a Tanakh book. He's saying that my grandfather spent many years learning Tanakh and wanted to write a compendium like a book of Musar. So it's ostracizing yeah. him through what, jealousy, basically? <coughs> so let's see. So this is my... We know it was super popular throughout. Not only back then, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls has Ben Sira. Oh. The Cairo Gniza has Ben Sira. So even a later, from like a thousand years ago, <laughs> Cash. The, uh, Hebrew. We have the Hebrew one. Hebrew. We have Greek copies and Hebrew. These are Hebrew ones. But why did it become yeah. so popular? Because I think it just, re I'm going to get to that in a second, but it's popular because it's just a really nice book of Musar. Very nice, wise words, like proverbs. Book, no? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like Pirkei Avot. It's a really nice to read. It's relatable. Everybody can read it. So it was never meant to be in Tanakh. We know it was super popular. The Dead Sea Scrolls have it. We even found one at Masada. There's a copy of Ben Sira that was found in Masada, which, so that's very ancient, right? That community was destroyed in the year 73. And over there, they even found a Ben Sira. So this is a very popular book, which is probably about 2,300, 2,200 years old. Yeah. 
something like that. Second Temple era. Yes, during the Second Temple era, for sure. So it was a hugely popular uh, book. And why was it so? I think, you know, it was singled out by the Gemara, by Rabbi Akiva, and no, it doesn't mention any other books, right? It says, what is a sefer, what is an example of Sifrei Chitzonim? Ben Sira. Right? That's the one. Why? Because it was just so popular. So they had to kind of go against that one, because probably the other ones weren't so popular, but this one was well known. So they specifically mentioned that one. Now, what my theory, this is just my theory, my hypothesis better, why I think they specifically wanted to ban Ben Sira, and why it was Rabbi Akiva who wanted to ban Sira, and not anybody else, because if you think about what was happening at that time, 2,000 years ago, there was this new religion popping up in the generation before Rabbi Akiva. You have these new Christians on the block, right? And Christianity is arguing that you don't have to fulfill the law anymore. So Christianity had this idea that, you know, the law is done, right? The Old Testament's done. Jesus fulfilled it for you. You don't have to do any of that. Just believe. And they abrogated Torah law. And so for them, it was just like, just be a good person kind of thing. Just generally, be a good person. You don't have to fulfill the law anymore. And Ben Sira plays into that very nicely because Ben Sira doesn't focus on laws. Ben Sira is just telling you how to be a good person, be a good friend, be a good husband, be a spouse, parent, son, child, whatever, how to be a good person. So it's just general musar, right? general ethics. So Christians would have loved it because for a Christian, Tanakh was irrelevant, really. The Torah was kind of irrelevant because we don't have to, they would say, we don't have to keep the law anymore. And there was no New Testament yet. Remember, the New Testament was not put together for many, many more decades after this, right? It was just being written now. So at this time, you know, at the end of the Second Temple era, the, the decades immediately following the destruction of the Temple, when Rabbi Akiva was active, there was no New Testament yet. There were these new sectarian Christians, and they wouldn't have cared so much for Chumash, because the law was irrelevant to them. So they would have been focused on books like Ben Sirah. And later, Christians did canonize Ben Sirah in their Bibles. Sometimes they call it Ecclesiasticus, like King Solomon's Ecclesiastes, and this Kohelet, and this Ecclesiasticus. So they did canonize it, Christian Bibles did. So I think, this is my theory, that Rabbi Akiva wanted to get rid of it because to separate, to make a clear division between those Christians, those new kids on the block, who are saying, you don't have to keep Torah, just be a good person. And I think he just wanted to make a clear separation and to root out that philosophy. And it's Rabbi Akiva specifically because his teacher, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus, we talked about this a couple of years ago. There's actually a, a story about him that once he was arrested and accused of being a Christian, Rabbi Eliezer. And after this, after he, because, you know, the Romans persecuted Christians. It was not allowed. The Romans persecuted Christians. That before they themselves became Christian, eventually the Roman Empire became Christian. But before that, initially, the Romans persecuted the Christians. And Rabbi Eliezer was accused and arrested for being a Christian. Anyway, he got himself out of it, but he was very depressed after. He says, why did this happen to me? Like me of all people, why would God do this to me? And in that story, it was specifically Rabbi Akiva who came and comforted him and told him, gave him a reason why, you know, this, that happened to him. So I think Rabbi Akiva was particularly sensitive to this problem because it was his own teacher, Rabbi Eliezer, who once got arrested for a mix-up because people thought maybe he was a Christian. You know? He was falsely accused. So Rabbi Akiva was a, a, a sensitive spot for him. And he really wanted to weed out Jews who were legitimate versus Jews who were following this messianic movement. Right. That's my theory. I don't know. Makes sense? Now, in later history, Ben Sira gets a really bad reputation. And you will find, and this is from really not a kosher source, but you'll hear this, and maybe you've heard it before that Ben Sira was the illegitimate child of Jeremiah the prophet, of Yirmiyahu. Have you heard this before? Maybe. Anyway, I'm not going to get into it. It's a really wild and terrible story. And it's 99% likely that it's not true. I mean, I, I'd be willing to say 100% not true. Uh, and it uses a gematria because the gematria of Yirmiyahu is equal to Ben Sira. So some people will say, you see, Ben Sira was actually the illegitimate child of Yirmiyahu. But where that legend comes from is from a book called, not this Ben Sira, but the Alphabet of Ben Sira. The Alphabet of Ben Sira is not Apocrypha. It's, not, it's a later text that was written probably in the 8th century. And it was clearly written as a satire. It was written by 
we don't know who, but somebody who was trying to give Jews a bad name, perhaps. But he wrote it as like just, just silly, nasty stories, terrible things that were written in this book. And people like Big Dolim and, and Rishonim, like the Rambam, were very much against this book and tried to expunge it and burn it and get rid of it because I think sometimes people were confusing it with, some, with like a real Midrash. But it's clearly not a real Midrash. And it's full of bizarre, very bizarre stories. And things like this, like that Ben Sear was the illegitimate child of Jeremiah. And what's interesting is there's another idea that's mentioned in this book. So don't confuse the book of Ben Sira, the ancient book of Ben Sira, with the alphabet of Ben Sira. Because the alphabet of Ben Sira is for sure illegitimate. You should not read it. It's heretical text. It's a satire. And the Rambam tried to expunge it completely. But in the alphabet of Ben Sira is this idea of, have you heard of this idea of Adam having originally a different wife, not Eve? That Adam had two wives? That there was a first a, a, what, Chava and a second Chava? And the first one is referred to as Lilith, okay, Lilith. And sometimes people are afraid to say that name. They say Lamed Yud because they don't want to invoke this person, this angel perhaps. So this is the story. Now, just before we go into this, the idea of a Lilith is a legitimate idea from Tanakh. Okay, there's a verse in Tanakh in Ishayahu that says in chapter 34 of Ishayahu that he actually mentions, he says that the Pasuk is just talking about various destructive things that will befall the people. And it says that there's going to be hyenas and, de- and seirim, which are like goat demons and things like that. And it says also lilit will find resting place there. So the word lilit is a legitimate, there is such a concept with a negative connotation that Isaiah mentions in Tanakh. Okay, now, what is lilit though? The Ibn Ezra who's a very a rationalist source, the Ibn Ezra comments and says Lilith is just off, off Shabbat Ya'uf Balayla. It's like some kind of predatory night vulture, I don't know, an owl, some kind of a predatory bird that flies at night. All right? So the Ibn Ezra is a, is a rationalist. He doesn't believe in demons and things like that. Uh, like the Rambam. The Rambam rejected anything superstitious or anything like that. And he says, no, Lilith is just a bird. But Rashi... Rashi is more mystical. Rashi says, Lilith Shem Shida. Shida. It's the name of a demon, a female demon. Okay. So there is such a thing. There is such a thing about Lilith. In, in later Kabbalistic literature, there's this idea that Lilith is the, the, yeah, like the top demoness and, uh, and temptress that she tempts men to sin sexually. She, come, she tempts men in their sleep. And she, she takes on that role as like the chief, the, the queen of all demons and the consort of the, her counterpart, Samael, like this evil angel, Samael, who sometimes identified with Satan, sometimes is a distinct figure. So, right. So now there's this legend, like where did Lilith come from? There is a legitimate concept of some kind of negative force called Lilith, but... There's also the story that originally Adam, the first wife that God made for Adam was, her name was Lilith, apparently. And they had a power struggle between them and Lilith wanted to be on top of him. And he said no. And ultimately she was banished from the Garden of Eden. And then Eve was the more um, submissive second wife. And that's the story. So... The alphabet of Ben Sira is one of the earliest sources of that story, which puts that story kind of into question. Is that a legitimate thing or not? That story of Adam having a first wife, it has a source in the Chumash because in Genesis chapter 1, the Torah says how God made Adam and Eve. And then in Genesis chapter 2, again, it seems to say how God made Adam and Eve, more specifically, that God took the etzem, like a side or a bone, and made Eve. So it seems like there's two creations of Adam Adam and Eve in the Torah, right? So it's based on that. It's trying to explain that idea that maybe there really was an original woman and then Chava was like a second wife. And the original wife, Lilith, once she was banished from the garden, she was upset and she became this angel who's going to tempt men forever. You know, like all the male descendants of Adam, she's going to try to annoy them 
and disturb them. All right, so that's the story of Lilith. In, in feminist literature, this took on a whole... I mean, I remember when I was younger, many years ago, and I never forgot it. This was maybe, I don't know, 20-some years ago. Maybe some of you remember this. There was a huge feminist concert at Damsview Park uh, led by Sarah McLaughlin and a lot of her singers. And the name of the concert was Lilith on Top. Oh, gosh. That was actually the name of the concert. So I remember that as a child because there was always commercials about it on TV. Uh, this is like around 2000, maybe, 99, 2000. And then, like, once I, like, started studying this, I'm like, oh, that's what she meant. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin. And then I actually looked it up, and that is what she meant. Like, she named that concert, concert after this as, like, women reclaiming their position on top, right? That's, that's deep, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting is, in the later, the Arizal explains this whole idea of, we do find a pattern in the Torah of people having two wives for some reason. Right, starting with Lamech, who has two wives, but then Avraham has two wives. Right? Avraham had Sarah, but then he had to be with Hagar. And then when Sarah passed away, he remarried her, and she's called Ketua, right? So she was like, so he had the second wife. And then Yaakov had Rachel and Leah, right? and then also their maids. But originally, <laughs> Rachel and Leah. And Mo- Moshe, Moshe had Sipora, and then he had that story with the Kushit. Remember, he took a, an, an Ethiopian wife. So there's this pattern of people at some point taking, not necessarily at the same time, which you know, would be forbidden technically today, not back then, but of, ha- of men having two wives. And even Rabbi Akiva, going back to Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva had a second wife. We know his first wife was Rachel, but he ended up marrying the what? widow of the Roman governor Turnus Rufus. So that's also a bizarre story. So the Arizal explains, very interesting. What's that? She converted, that's right. So Rabbi Akiva explains, Okay, so the first of the Arizal says, so Adam had two wives. The first was Lilith. So that's, that's when the actual, the one that was made from his own bone was the second wife. Okay, that's why it says Zotapam. This time, right, that's why the verse there says, this time she is my, the right match. It's good, right? It's good. Exactly. So I'm saying there is a legitimate source for this. There is a legitimate source for this, because in chapter 2 of Genesis, when God made Eve, Adam said, Zotapam, this time she's a good wife. Lilith. No, but in the source, what does it say? What does it say? No, it doesn't say. Yeah, it just says male and female. He created Adam. Yeah, it doesn't give a name explicitly in the Torah. And then, Gam Yaakov Ayulosh Lea Verachel, Velea Kula Dinim, and he explains. Leah was the corresponding to the first wife, and Rachel to the to Chava. And so that was his tikkun, that Yaakov had to go through this thing where he was forced to kind of tricked into marrying Leah as a tikkun for Adam's issue that he had, struggle with Lilith. And that's why Leah was kula dinim. She had a very hard life, right? She suffered a lot. She was always crying in Leah Rakot and so on. And that pattern continues and all the way through all these people that we mentioned, Moshe and the Kushit and, and Sipora, they all correspond to these two. That's why there's always a struggle with one. And it goes all the way to Rabbi Akiva. The, the Arizal says, And he, he married her, the wife of Turnus Rufus, this Roman woman. Again, it was a tikkun for this whole idea going back to Adam and Lilith and Chava. Uh, And there's other interpretations of what what Lilith is. In another place, the Arizal, in the same place, in in, uh, in Shab Sukim, he actually says that Lilith is also the flaming sword that was placed to protect the Garden of Eden. So he says that a klipot, the negative forces in creation, have masculine and feminine, Zaharu Nekeva. And he says that the first kind are called mazikim, and the second kind are called shedim. So one is masculine, one is feminine, and the lilit is the feminine, samael is the masculine, and he explains all that. And he says that they're also that, symbolically, the flaming sword that blocks the way to the Garden of Eden. So there's, there's multiple ways of looking at this. If you're going to be a rationalist like the Ibn Ezra and the Rambam, you're probably going to they would have rejected all of this, the Arizal, you know, more mystical. And there is a way to kind of put this together, to reconcile them in this little 
paragraph, if you see them as Lilith and Samael and all these things, as just spiritual husks, as klipot, as things that exist in nature to kind of make life more interesting, to provide a balance of good and evil, to give you more choice, and God on purpose created this whole world of the sitra acha, of the evil side, of these, these evil forces, that their job is just to maintain the balance in creation, the balance between good and evil. So that's Ben Sira. Okay. Uh, I really wanted to get into the book of Maccabees. That one is just absolutely fascinating. And we have a whole Sefer Maccabim. There's a whole book of Maccabees. There's at least two of them. But nobody reads them because they've been considered like apocrypha. And so nobody studies them. But they're really fascinating. And why they weren't included, I mean, really simply because the simplest reason is because they were written so late. Right? The Maccabee Wars were in the second century BCE, so it was just too late to be included in the Tanakh. And they themselves say, that the book of Maccabees actually recounts how the Tanakh was put together. And it doesn't claim to be part of Tanakh, it just really clearly, the book of Maccabees says, this is a historical book, we just want to record what happened. It's an eyewitness account, the first book of Maccabees, the second book of Maccabees. It goes in detail into all the battles, into all the people involved, the sons of Matityahu, the Maccabees. It's a fascinating book. If you like history, if you like military history, if you like battles, it's great. It is quite spiritual. It does talk about various miracles that happened. You know, in one case, the, of course, the Greeks outnumbered the Jews, and Yehuda Maccabee was charging into battle, and angels appeared from the sky and were fighting on behalf of the Jews and the Maccabees, and the Greeks just retreated, and everybody praised Hashem. And so it is actually still a very spiritual book that recalls many miracles. But what's most interesting about it, it has a miracle of oil, but not the one you think. That's what's really cool. Okay, so you know the, the, the official story that we have, the rabbinic account, the Talmudic account, is that when they finally cleaned up the temple, the Greeks profaned the temple. When the Maccabees finally reconquered it and cleaned it up, they wanted to relight the menorah. They couldn't find any pure oil. And then finally they found one little cruise, which would have been enough for a day. You know the story. And it lasted for eight days until eight days, presumably because that's how long it took to get, make some fresh oil, olive oil, or deliver some, import some from somewhere else that was untampered with. That's the official story. We all know that. It's fantastic. It's true. But then there's another account. So the book of Maccabees has a different miracle of oil. This is what it says. On the 25th day of Kislev, that's the first day of Hanukkah, we shall celebrate the purification of the temple. Okay, we know. We thought it necessary to notify you. So the person's writing this as an eyewitness account. They're going to spread these books to other Jewish communities around the world. So they want you, we, you, we want you in the diaspora to know that this is what happened in Jerusalem. On the 25th of Kislev, we were, gonna, we were celebrating the purification of the temple. We want to notify you that uh, in order that you also may celebrate the Feast of Booths, which is Sukkot, to celebrate Sukkot, and the Feast of the Fire given, and this is the key part. So they're saying, what it's saying here is, we just had Sukkot two months ago, right? This is the 25th of Kislev. Sukkot was two months ago. But did they celebrate Sukkot two months ago? No, because they didn't have the temple and everybody was in battle. It was a war. So they missed Sukkot. So they said, now we got the temple. What are we going to do? Let's make up for Sukkot. So this is okay, so now we're going to make, that's why it's eight days, because Sukkot's eight days. So we're going to keep an eighth day Sukkot now. And we're going to commemorate this, and we're going to commemorate something else, the Feast of the Fire that happened during the time of Nehemiah. Remember Ezra and Nehemiah at the beginning of the Second Temple era? They came back from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple, and now the temple's built, and they have to reignite the flame on the altar. And remember, the Torah says that the flame of the altar has to be eshtamid, an eternal flame. The fire on the altar in the temple could never be put out. It was one perpetual flame. Nehemiah, he built the temple and the altar and offered sacrifices. Now, when our fathers were being led captive to Persia, to Babel, the pious priests of the time took some of the fire of the altar and secretly hid it in the hollow of a dry cistern, where they took such precautions that the place was unknown to anyone. So before the temple was destroyed the first time, they took some of that eternal fire, hid it somewhere in, in the temple mount in a secret location because they knew one day they'd come back and they'd have the fire. How it would stay burning for 70 years isn't clear. After many years had passed, 
When it pleased God, Nehemiah, having been commissioned by the king of Persia, sent the descendants of the priests who had hid the, hidden the fire to get it. They reported to us that they had not found fire, but oil. So they didn't find the fire, but they did find some old first temple oil when they built the second temple. So they were looking to reestablish the Eshtamid. They couldn't find that fire, but they found oil from the first temple. Awesome. And so what did they do? He ordered them to dip it out and bring it. And when the material for the sacrifices was presented, Nehemiah ordered the priests to sprinkle the oil on the wood and what was laid upon it. When this was done and some time had passed and the sun, which had been clouded over, shone out, a great fire blazed up so that all marveled. So what happened in the beginning of the Second Temple era, they were looking for some fire, the original Eshtamid, they couldn't find it. They found oil, though, from the First Temple. They poured it on the wood, and it miraculously ignited just by sunlight alone. The clouds opened up, the sun lit the flame, and it's like as if the Eshtamid came back from the First Temple. So what the Book of Maccabees is saying is that this happened on the 25th of Kislev, and this is what they're celebrating. That was the miracle of oil. Still a miracle of oil, a different miracle of oil. Very interesting. Right. So it's a slightly different, not slightly, it's quite different account of the miracle of oil and the so eighth the day. So the of Lenora or anything like that in the book of Maccabees? No, not That's here. Crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. not here. It mentions many miracles. They could have both happened. Like it's not, why not? Why not both? So the book of Maccabees just doesn't seem to mention the whole miracle of the menorah. So awesome. It's an eyewitness account. This particular person maybe wasn't there. Who knows? So I, I would say they're both true. Right? We're not going to dispute the official, this, this you know. More, more like, more real, whereas the other, the other story, the one that we all know, the eight days, seems a child's story. Maybe, maybe. I think we can accept both, both versions, and say they both happen, and they're both true. And this just adds, this, this version adds to the official... It's still a miracle of oil that happened on the 25th of Kislev. It's still purifying the temple. It would be nice to know the, the key, truth, that's the bottom line. The key elements are the same. Let's put it that way. Right, the key elements are the same. The miracle of oil, the military victory, the purification of the temple, the defeat of the Hellenists, the, you know, all that stuff is good. I mean, the, the book of Maccabees is interesting because it has other things that are very religious, and you might not like this one because of our previous conversations, because it says that the Maccabees, they weren't called Maccabees, by the way. Because only Yehuda's nickname was Maccabee. Later, they were all called Maccabees. But in the book of Maccabees, it actually introduces the five sons, and they each have their own nickname. And it was Yehuda whose nickname was Maccabeus. But they themselves referred to themselves as Hasidim. Hasidim. They were the Hasidim. These were the first Hasidim. And the first Hasidim were the ones that were fighting the Hellenists. Today, back then, they did. <laughs> they did very well. So in the book of Maccabees, it actually says that there were 6,000 soldiers originally. And four of the brothers each took 1,500 soldiers to command. And the fifth brother, Eleazar, they left him to learn Torah, to read Torah and pray for them. All right. So that has a parallel to what's happening today in Israel with the IDF and the religious people who are supposed to be studying on their behalf and spiritually protecting them. That actually has a clear parallel in the book of Maccabees. So, yes. you know, th there is a, a source for that. So they should, that. they should be using this book more often. They should, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so maybe the Haredim should. Yeah. Yes, of course, that's true. That is the difference. Yes, yes, that's true. Correct. They did also... It wasn't like these ones only fought and these ones only studied because Elazar himself, although at the beginning he was put in charge of the studying and the praying, ultimately he did have to go fight and he did fight very valiantly and he actually, most of them died in battle. Elazar also died in battle in a very famous incident that he went after the, the Greek general who was on a war elephant and he slid underneath and he speared the elephant, killed the elephant, but the elephant collapsed on him. And he got tra like kind of trampled by the elephant. So Eleazar also died heroically. And Shimon is really the only one that survived. And we're going to talk about him as well. And in the book of Maccabees, it actually says about, last time we mentioned the Ark of the Covenant, and that likely it was destroyed. And there's various theories, if it would have survived, where it would have gone. One of the theories, and the Talmud talks about this in Masechet Yomah, is that it was buried somewhere 
in a secret place on the Temple Mount. And there is support for that here because it says, one finds in the records that Jeremiah the prophet ordered that those who were being deported take some of the fire, as has been told, and that the prophet, after giving them the law, instructed those who were being deported not to forget the commandments of Hashem, not to be led astray in their thoughts. And what he did after this was, he, having received an oracle, he received prophecy, ordered that the tent, the oil, and the ark, the Aaron, right, the ark of the covenant, should follow with him, and that he went out to the mountain where Moses had gone up and had seen the inheritance of God. And Jeremiah came and found a cave, and he brought there the tent and the ark and the altar of incense, and he sealed up the entrance. So, and Jeremiah says, the place shall be unknown until God gathers his people again. So here there is the suggestion that the Ark of the Covenant was not destroyed, that Yirmiyahu and Avi, Jeremiah, saved the Ark of the Covenant and some of the other parts of the temple and placed them in a secret cave where Moshe was buried because he was also buried in a secret mountain. Remember this? So that lends support to the idea that the Ark of the Covenant did survive and was buried somewhere. Well, how, how, yeah. how are you connecting it to the same place? Because I think it says that it was so secret that nobody... Jeremiah says received an oracle that he got a prophecy oh, oh. from heaven and he found that he was told where to hide it until you know Mashiach comes now so that's one problem so the problem with the Mac- Maccabees is that it does contradict the official account of the miracle of oil it's a late book so it wouldn't have been included in Tanakh the other thing is that it was written in Greek and so this brings up a question of can a Greek text be considered holy is can something that was originally written in Greek be you know, be suitable for Tanakh, right? We said last time that Tanakh has to have books that are in Hebrew. So can we use Greek? And the Mishnah says in Masachet Megillah, something that might surprise you. It says like this, There's no difference between writing Torah scrolls and mezuzahs and tefillin, that you can write Torah scrolls, Tanakh scrolls in any language. But, tefillin mezuzot, only ena nichtavot ala ashurit. You can only write it in the ashurit script that we use today, the Hebrew script that we use today. So tefillin and mezuzahs, as you might expect, should be written in Hebrew. But other books, scroll, like Torah scrolls, can be written in any language. You can translate them into any language. But then, Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel says, af bisfarim lo hitiru, they did not permit writing sfarim in any language. Only Ela Yavanit, only in Greek. So you could only write Torah scrolls in Hebrew or in Greek. And the Gemara questions that and says, why only Greek? And it says, Umishu Mase the Talmai Amelech, because of the famous story of Talmai, which we mentioned last time, that King Ptolemy took 72 sages, as you remember, Shekines Shivim Ushnaim Skenim, he took 70 or 72 sages, and he put them, and he put them in 72 separate rooms, and he made each of them write a Torah. He, put them, he separated them to make sure that they don't lie and that they translated it accurately so that it would all be the same. And a miracle happened. What was the miracle? They all made the same, they all made the same right? He told them, and Natan HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Belev Kol Echad Ve'echad Etzah, that God directed all of them, Ve'iskimu Kulan Ladat Achat, and they all produced the same translation. So there was a miracle here. So the Talmud is saying, clearly, God miraculously helped them produce a genuine Greek Tanakh. So Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel says, only Greek would be permitted not any other language, because here it clearly says that God put into the hearts of these 72 sages the wisdom to translate it into Greek. So there is something holy there about the Septuagint, or originally was, because it did change over the centuries. And then the Talmud actually goes on to say that they made changes. They made about 15 changes or so, dozen or so changes, 15 changes, deliberately, when they translate into Greek. And the first, we're not going to go through all of them, but the first change was, you know, the Torah, well, how does the Torah begin? If all 72 yeah. the same. Yes, miraculously, they all made the same edits. Uh-huh. The first one was, the Torah begins, Bereshit bara Elohim, right? In the beginning, what is it? If you were to read that literally, in the beginning created God. Right? That's the phrasing, Bereshit bara Elohim. They rewrote it as, Elohim bara Bereshit, that God created in the beginning. That's how they put it into Greek. So that the Greeks wouldn't think that in the beginning, God was created. See that? Because Greeks had their pagan beliefs. Their gods were born and created and whatever, right? 
their gods had married each other and had children and things like that. So they shouldn't think that God was created. So they put God first. And they changed where it says, the Torah says, Na adam betsalmenu, right? God says, let us make man in our image. They made it, e'ase adam betselem. I, like, I will make man in my image. So that, again, so the Greeks wouldn't think that this is some kind of polytheism. That they wouldn't assume that let us make man implies that there's a pantheon of gods. But it's interesting yeah. that they wouldn't look back now at, the, at, at what it was translated from and disqualify the whole translation because it didn't really translate it literally. You know what I mean? It's important to remember a few things that the Septuagint here, it says that the rabbis only made 15 changes. But the Septuagint that we have today has hundreds of change, differences with our, Torah, with our Tanakh, with our Torah. So it's clearly not the same. Right? The Septuagint has changed. This book, the, the Greek Tanakh that was translated, that it's called the Septuagint, meaning the, of the 70, of the 70 sages. Okay, and then the Talmud really concludes that the Alacha goes according to Alacha uh, Kerabban Shimon ben Gamaliel. Although he is the individual opinion here, the Alacha goes according to him. Okay, and how did Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel prove it? Because the Torah says, Yaft Elohim leyefet veishkon be'oalei Shem. When Noah had three sons, right? Shem, Ham, and Yefet. Yefet is the forefather of the Europeans, particularly the Greeks. The Greeks actually have one of their gods. It's called Yapetus, who's just Yefet, right? So they use that name as well. And Shem is our forefather, and Ham is the, the forefather of Africa, generally speaking. So because the Pasuk says that Yefet will dwell Ishkon be'oalei Shem, that Yefet will dwell in the tents of Shem, that's a proof that Greek and Hebrew wisdom will kind of live in one tent one day at one point. Right? That was kind of like a prophecy that Yefet and Shem one day will come together in some way. You know, that Yefet will dwell in the tents of Shem. So that Greek does have a place in Judaism. And if you study Talmud, there's a Greek word on every page. Right? There's Greek words. The rabbis used many Greek loan words throughout the Talmud, okay? including Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, we quote from it all the time. We started with Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin's a Greek word, right? Sanhedrion, Afikoman is a Greek word, and many others. The reason that, you know, Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel himself is the one who's saying this, just as a side point, because he was actually fluent in Greek, and he studied Greek wisdom. And he said that in his father's house, in Rabban Gamaliel's house, there was 500 people learning Torah and 500 people learning Greek wisdom. And he says all of them were killed during the, the Great Revolt. And Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel says only I survived and one of his cousins. So he actually grew up studying among a thousand scholars, half of which were studying Torah, half of which were studying Greek. And so he knew Greek wisdom very well. And the Talmud says that it was permitted for them because they were the presidents of Israel. Rabban Gamliel was the president, and Rabban Shimon then inherited that. And for the presidents of Israel, it was permitted because they had to socialize with Greeks, and they had to know Greek to deal with the government, because that was the official language Doesn't of the Eastern the Roman Emperor. They have to be proficient in 70 languages. In order for the Sanhedrin, yeah. Yes. yes, for the Sanhedrin. He was the president of he the Sanhedrin. The yeah. 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 So there is an interesting discussion there as well, like what should we speak? And there's an opinion that you should either speak, it says in Israel, you should only speak Hebrew or Greek, right? Very interesting, right? Like why don't speak Aramaic if you're in Israel? You should only speak Hebrew or Greek. And so well, what about if you're in Babylon? Should you speak Farsi or Aramaic, right? That's actually, that's a discussion, very interesting. It says, Amar Rebbe, Rabbi Yudan Nasi, Be'eretz Yisrael, Lashon Sursi, Lama, like why do you guys speak Syrian, Aramaic? O Lashon HaKodesh, or you speak Hebrew, O Lashon Yavanit. Right. And Amar Rabbi Yossi Bebavel, Lashon Arami Lama, why do you guys speak Aramaic? You're right. O Lashon HaKodesh, either speak Hebrew or speak Parsi. Right. Speak the, the, the Persian language. They didn't particularly like Aramaic. And they said, well, what's, why, why Greek? What's so special about Greek? Amre Lashon Yavani, Lachud, Chochmat Yavani, Lachud. That the, the Greek language is special. And Greek wisdom is special. It's, it's discreet. It has its own beauty. So the sages weren't so opposed to Greek, as much as we might think, you know. Is it the same Greek that they speak today in Greece? It's not exactly the same. Languages evolve, right? This is Greek 2,000 years ago, so for sure the language has changed. Anymore. Yeah, the language has changed, I'm sure, like significantly. Spanish, you know, 500 years ago, it's not the same as today. Is Greek like Latin? Is that what 
it's very different. No, it's two different language families, very different. Greek, the Greek alphabet itself is based on the Hebrew alphabet, right? Because the Phoenicians who lived just north of Israel, they carried that alphabet all across the Mediterranean. The Greeks got the alphabet from the Phoenicians who got it from the Hebrews. It's the same alphabet, right? So Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet is just Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. It's the same. It's really the same thing, right? And the Greeks also had gematria. Gematria is a Greek word. That's another Greek word, right? Uh, and the Greeks also had gematria. They, they used like letter, number, letter combinations, right? And looked at the numerical value of words. So there's, there's a lot in common between Greek and Hebrew. And that's what the sages are really talking about here. So ultimately, if you know what happened after the Maccabees won the war, Shimon, the last of the five brothers, reestablished like an independent Jewish state. And he was very righteous. In fact, he's called in the book of Maccabees, Simon the Righteous, Shimon the Tzaddik. And we have a Shimon the Tzaddik, which is really a fascinating thing that we have to discuss. Uh, but after him, very quickly, his follower, he was assassinated. And after him, the next generation of, of the Hashmonaim, of that dynasty, they became Hellenists. They became exactly what their parents and grandparents were fighting. And the Hashmonai dynasty was not beloved at all. They descended into fighting. They became very Greek. Uh, the worst of them was Alexander Yanai, who was one of the kings of the Hashmonaim, and he persecuted the rabbis and tried to Hellenize Israel. So actually, it's like everything turned upside down. And so the Hashmonaim and the Maccabee descendants were really not loved so much, which is why they were downplayed. And the book of Maccabees was really suppressed because people didn't like them. People didn't like what, what the result. A few generations later, the Hashmonaim became very wicked. And they were the ones that welcomed the Romans in. There was a power struggle between two of them for the throne, and they invited Pompey the Great, the, the Roman general Pompey, who was the, the companion of Julius Caesar, to settle the dispute. And Pompey came and said, you know what, I kind of like this place. I'll keep it for myself. <laughs> you know, I'll take it. So, and that's how Judea became a Roman province. It was handed over by the Hashmonaim, really, to the Romans. So they were really despised eventually. And so that's why the book of Maccabees was suppressed. And that's why there's no tractate for Hanukkah. There's a tractate for every major holiday. There's a tractate for Purim. There's a tractate for Rosh Hashanah. Everything, Sukkot, right? There's, but there's no tractate Hanukkah. There's no tractate Hanukkah. So even that, we, we, where the Talmud speaks about Hanukkah is in Masachet Shabbat. So they really tried to suppress the, the whole Maccabee thing because of the result of what came so out of it. So is it also because they, I mean, these were Kohanim, and, they, and they, everything was per perfect yeah. until they took upon themselves the... the yeah, as Kohanim, they weren't allowed to rule, and right. they took on the kingship as well. Shimon, when he himself took on the title, he didn't take on the title king. He, called, he, he had the Greek title Strategos, but then after him, they took on the title Basileus, which is king, and that was already... That's not it. allowed. The only official version of the Hanukkah story is only in Shabbat? In Masachet Shabbat, yeah. That's where it comes from. Okay, just a few more points and we're done. One is this idea of who was Shimon, the, the, the last of the five brothers that survived and then rebuilt the country. He's called Simon Tassi, Shimon Tassi, which in Greek means Shimon the Righteous, Shimon the Tzaddik. And in, in, in rabbinic text, there is a Shimon HaTzadik. In Pirkei Avot, what does it say? Shimon HaTzadik was the last of the Anshei Knesset HaGdola. And so the rabbinic tradition, he's sometimes considered like the first rabbi, Shimon HaTzadik. Wasn't he a Kohen Gadol? Yeah. And he was, and, and Simon of the Hashmonaim was the Kohen Gadol, right? Oh, he was, he was. Yeah, he was a Kohen Gadol. The Shimon HaTzadik that's given in the Talmud, it gives a few stories about him, and they span many centuries. One puts him at the time of Alexander the Great. One puts him later in Roman times. So which of the Talmuds, Shimon the Tzaddik, is the historical one? And it's this one. It's the one in Pirkei Avot. It's the one who, it says his student was Antigonus, right? Antigonus in Pirkei Avot is the next person after Shimon the Tzaddik. So Antigonus is a Greek name, yeah? A lot of the Talmudic sages had Greek names. Sumchus, Papa, Aftalion, those are all Greek names, Alexandri. So many of the Talmudic sages themselves had Greek names. <clears throat> and Shimon Atzadik's main partner and student was Antigonus. So this is here in this, in this Greek time. So I think that a case can be made, and I'm not the first person who made this case, that Shimon Atzadik in the, in the Talmud is Shimon Tassi, the Maccabee, which is really amazing when you think about it, right? And the time just fits perfectly. If you look at Pirkei Avot, the generations work out really nicely. The time period that Shimon Atzadik is in, 
it's precisely that time. So if you're interested in that, I wrote an article about it several years ago, going in depth about who is exactly Shimon HaTzadik. The Talmud, the original historical Shimon HaTzadik in the Talmud, who is he? And I made the case there that it's Shimon Tassi, the Maccabee. So if you're interested in that, I can send it to you. Another point to keep in mind, the Talmud talks about, uh, sorry, the Book of Maccabees talks about Yom Nikano, which also our sages talk about. It was a holiday that was celebrated on the 13th of Adar because Nikano was one of the Greek generals that was extremely cruel and wicked. And Yehuda Maccabee was able to defeat him and they chopped his head off and paraded it, and they had a party when he, they finally got rid of him. So that was called Yom Nikanor, and it was celebrated on the 13th of Adar. And the book of Maccabees reads like this, it says, And Yehuda hung Nikanor's head from the citadel, a clear and conspicuous sign to everyone of the help of Hashem. He wanted to show, here, Hashem helped us, we got him. And they all decreed by public vote, never to let this day go unobserved, but to celebrate the 13th day of the 12th month, which is Adar, which we all know now. The day before Mordechai's day. Purim, right? The day before Mordechai's day, the 13th of Adar, would be celebrated as Yom Nikano. And our sages talk about it. This was celebrated. He, the book of Maccabees is called Mordechai's day. Purim. The, the Megillat Esther says that the holiday is called Purim. At the same time, but yeah. that's, I think, the 14th, no? Yeah, Purim's on the 14th. So right. that's why it's saying we celebrate Yom Nikano on the 13th, the day before Mordechai's day. We stopped, today we stopped keeping Yom Nikanor, and there's various theories for why that is, but in temple times they celebrated Yom Nikanor. The, the, the general idea is that since the temple was destroyed, and we're kind of sad and whatever, we don't celebrate Yom Nikanor anymore, and because again we don't have a temple, and instead today we actually commemorate it as Ta'anit Esther, as a fast day. But in temple times, this was a holiday. The 13th of Adar was a holiday. That was called Yom Nikanor. One more point. Do you have energy or we leave it for next time? Well, that's another one. Okay, one last interesting point. Since we're already talking about <laughs> Greeks and Hebrews and how we ha- actually had a lot in common, it's important to remember that when the Maccabees, the Hashmonaim, the Hasidim, when they fought the Greeks, they fought the Syrian Greeks, right? the Seleucid Greeks. Because remember, after Alexander the Great, the empire split. They didn't fight the other Greeks. In fact, <clears throat> they were supported by the other Greeks. So sometimes we simplify it and say Spartans, that Spartans, Jews... Yeah that Jews fought Greeks, but that wasn't, we fought the Syrian Greeks, the Seleucid Greeks, and who do you think armed us? Well, we got weapons from some of the other Greeks, Ptolemy. and support, what's that? Ptolemy. Ptolemy, that's right. So the Egyptian Greeks wanted us to, to, to defeat their competitors, the Seleucid Greeks, and so did the mainland Greeks. So one of the things that the book of Maccabees says is like this, Yonatan, the high priest, and the council of the nation and the priests, and the rest of the Jewish people send greetings to their brothers, the Spartans. So the Maccabees send a letter to Sparta asking for support. In former times, a letter was sent to the high priest Onius, Honio, there was a priest named Honio, from Arius, who was then your king, to say that you are our kinsman. So there was this letter, letter of, uh, of Arius, the king of Sparta, that the Maccabees had received, saying that the Spartans and the Jews are kinsmen, that were brothers. And Onius showed honor to the man who was sent to him and accepted the letter, which contained a declaration of alliance and friendliness. So Sparta, the great Spartan warriors, were allies with the Maccabees against the Syrian Greeks. And now it says in this letter, he says, although we are in no need of these, since we find our encouragement in the sacred books that are in our keeping, says we get our strength from God. We don't need your help at the moment. Uh, We have undertaken to send to renew relations of brotherhood and friendliness with you so that we may not become estranged from you, right? So they're saying, like, let's just keep the peace. Don't join the Seleucids against us. We don't need your help. God helps us. But we just want to remember that we're brothers here. And then it's quoting the letter of Arius. Arius, king of the Spartans, sends greetings to Onius, the high priest. It is found in writing that the Spartans and Jews are kinsmen and that they are both of the stock of Abraham. So apparently, apparently, Arius believed himself to be a descendant of Abraham. Now, how is this possible? There was another Greek writer called Cleodemus living around the same time. And Cleodemus said something amazing. He gave a genealogy here. You remember Abraham, like we said earlier, had Keturah, and with her he had many more children. And it says that, the Torah itself says that Abraham sent all those children away. Right, eastward, and he left Israel so that there wouldn't be any land disputes. He said, Israel belongs to Yitzhak. All the other kids go somewhere else. He gave them gifts, and he sent them out. One of those kids was called Ether. Ether. 
And Cleodema says Efer went to Africa, which is why it's called Africa. Whoa. The name Africa comes from Efer, one of those descendants of Abraham through Keturah. That's where Africa comes from, according to Cleodemus. And Efer ended up, it says, marrying there. And one of his descendants was Diodorus, a founder of Sparta. Diodorus was a descendant of Efer, who came from Abraham. So that's a very long genealogy. But apparently the Spartans believed that they also came from Abraham. And really the Spartans had little in common with other Greeks. They were unique. They were different than all the other Greeks. And they had a lot more in common with Jews, interestingly enough. Not the violence and the infanticide and the sodomy that came along with, with later. But uh, we know that the Spartans celebrated Rosh Chodesh. They held to like a lunar calendar. And even, I even one scholar even said that they would celebrate a day of rest every quarter moon, meaning like a, a lunar cycle is 28, 29 days. So every quarter, meaning like every seventh day, they kept the Sabbath. They kept, that was their day of rest. Very interesting. And although Greeks had many gods, Sparta really only venerated one god, right. which was Ares, right? The god of war. That was their god. And so they're still idolaters. I'm not saying that they, they weren't. Certainly later they became idolaters. But it seems like originally they venerated one god who they described as the god of war. Now, why that's interesting is if you think about how God is described throughout the Tanakh, the more, most common description of God by far, by far the most common description of God in Tanakh, Hashem Tzvaot, the God of legions, the God of armies. And he's always described as on a chariot, right? God's angels are riding chariots. He's the God of legions. We read in, in our prayers in Shirat Ayam, we sing Shirat Ayam, Hashem Ish Milchama. God is a man of war. It's in Shirat Ayam, right? We, we say it in our prayers, we say it, it's in the Torah, that God is called the man of war. He is the God of legions. Over and over again, the Tanakh calls him a God of war. And we recite in our prayers that God fights for us. Hashem Ilachem Lachem, right? So there is a very incredible parallel there. If you think about that, that Spartans venerated this one God, the, the, the Greek God of war. And so there, you see the, the similarities. And, and by the way, Josephus, you know, the Spartans were famous for stoicism, being stoic, right? Living very simply and being very in control of yourself and a lot of musav. And when Josephus wrote about the Jews to his non-Jewish audience, to the Romans, he described, he, when he wanted to explain who the rabbis are, he says the rabbis are like Jewish stoics. Okay? So that's how, so that the non-Jewish people would understand who the Jews are and the rabbis are. So there is a lot in common between like Spartan stoicism and the Spartan strength and war and their, their calendar and Rosh Chodesh. We have a lot in common. So there, is, there may be more to this connection than meets the eye of the Spartans and the Maccabees being allies and the Spartans believing themselves to also have perhaps come from the stock of Abraham, as they say. Okay, there's more to say, but we'll pause here and we'll continue next time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.